have like five slides and I even killed half the season. <laughs> um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And first, right off the bat, I want to say thank you to Amanda and Rebecca for deciding to do this. I mean, this obviously is, is a big endeavor. It's never been really awkward. Um, it's a big endeavor to bring something like this to Sacramento. I've started four businesses in Sacramento. I love Sacramento. And I think it's amazing when the community um, starts doing more things and, and creates things for people who are in the community to stay here, be creative, and feel supported. So kudos to you guys, the entire thing coming together. I think that's really awesome. I'm happy to be here and happy to be the first one because nobody else has been better than me yet. <laughs> so solid. <laughs> I'm already doing it. I was going to do a whole presentation at Comic Sans. I figured you <laughs> And like that weird mark for that HTML default blue, but we'll move we'll it back to Helvetica. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Craig Patterson. I live here and actually live in Lincoln, but um, I grew up in Vacaville, not far from here. Um, I literally have no idea what the hell I'm going to say. I have a rough idea that we're going to get through it together. <laughs> I might offend some people, I might embarrass myself, I might embarrass some people here. We'll figure it out. Um, the basic gist is, yeah. I grew up in Vacaville, but it's a much more complicated story than that. Um, I've lived a lot of places, which we'll get to. But throughout my entire career, my entire life, the driving force has been music. The driving force has been creating. The driving force has been putting something of myself into whatever it is I choose to do when I get out of bed in the morning, and making sure that when I go to sleep at night, I feel good about how I spent that day. <clears throat> so today I work at Eventbrite, and a funny thing happens. I, I, I sold a company to Eventbrite earlier this year. Um, my, one of my co-founders, Vinny, who's sitting here in the front room, and he needs to feel very nervous. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the funny thing happens when you sell a company, you end up, or even when you start a company, you ask for money from people. You end up having to talk about yourself a lot, which I'm extremely uncomfortable with. Um, so, spoiler alert, we never raised any money. Ever. <laughs> um, got pretty close to never raising money. We bootstrapped it and bootstrapped all the businesses I've ever started. And, uh, but you end up having to talk about yourself a lot, you end up kind of talking about your story. And, Something happens when you talk about the story is that you realize 25 years into the music industry, it sounds like it's really, you know, you know, I did this and I did that, and then I, I met this person and did that. And voila, it sounds like you know, we have this really great executed plan. But it ends up being like a lot of stuff falls out. And when people write their bios and they tell you their story, they leave out all of the bullshit. They leave out all the failures, all the stress, they don't tell you about that, and they thought they were gonna fail or they're gonna lose their business or have to fire their entire staff or didn't know how they're going to make payroll. None of that shit comes out. So I'm kind of trying to put a lens on that. So, um, but I'm really, I really don't like talking about myself, and I don't, I'm not really a good self-promoter, so thanks. So I've lived in 10 different cities, all but four of them before the age of 14. I've lived in 24 houses, over half of them before I was age 18. I went to 12 and a half grade schools between grade 11, and I dropped out, and took my GED and went on tour. Any of you starting a family, this is not how you do it. <laughs> not recommended. What this did though is it, it, it made me um, really comfortable starting over. Really comfortable feeling like I had to run into a crowd and reintroduce myself or identify myself. It made me okay with um, uncertainty. And, and to some degree, not having a community and feeling lonely. This is a real bummer, so <laughs> you know, this is where we got to get out of this part. <laughs> so how does that relate to sound? Somewhere around like junior high or, or right before, actually probably a little earlier in the 80s, um, I discovered, I'm hoping I don't see the bunch there, so I'm just going to, I have no idea what's coming next. We'll go. There it is. <laughs> I discovered skateboarding, which is not, doesn't sound, it's a bit sore. But there's something around skateboarding. There's a culture, there's an aesthetic, there's a creativeness. There's this, these are the only 80 skateboards in the Bones Brigade. And this changed my life. Because essentially, it was a sport you did on your own. It was creative. It was individual. You could just try and be determined enough to figure something out. And there's a sound that came with it, which was the clicking clack of a skateboard on the side. And for a kid who moved every couple of years or every year, Whenever you heard the clicky clack on the sidewalk, you knew there was another kid like you that you instantly had something you could talk about, that you could instantly walk up to and make a new friend. And the other thing that came along with this was punk rock. In the background of all this, they, they saw these videos, the Bones Brigade did, they were legendary and amazing. There's a documentary about it, I'd recommend it. Awesome. 
That's where I discovered punch rock. So these, these videos, you want to see Tony Hawk skate, well, you're going to see Tony Hawk skate, and then in the background, you're going to hear the adolescence. And you're going to fall in love with this noise, and you're like, what is that? This doesn't sound like Duran Duran. It's not the Cockney Twins. Um, and I just fell in love with that sound. It was chaotic. It was nutty. And when I was in uh, high school, these, uh, this is Green Day in about 92 or 93. Um, when I was in high school, there were these older, cool kids. One of them had like, black hair, and fell over his face, and he was in the cure, and it was awesome. <laughs> um, but they put on shows at the Community Center in Vacaville, and they, just two dudes, and they had bands coming. Some friends of mine dragged me there. And to that point, you know, all I thought was, you know, even the bands I'd heard in the skate videos, I thought they were like, you know, Metallica. I thought they were huge. And when I walked into this room, there was these guys that looked like me, this band uh, from Nevada City called The Circus Tent. And uh, they looked like me, and there were kids that looked like me, and there were people in the room just screaming and yelling and slamming into each other and climbing on the stage and jumping off the stage and just going nuts. And I was like, yeah, I want to do that. Like, whatever that is, I want to do that. That looks awesome. And that's really where it started. And the rest of high school, I, I snuck off to the bay uh, every time a chance I got to go see shows. And this is, I saw Granny for like 10 times in a room not bigger than this. Um, so I no doubt in a room not bigger than this. And at the time, it's, it goes back to that, that theme of organized chaos, it never felt like it was going to be this band's going to play arenas. This is a guy down the road that looked like me, talked like me, sounded like me, and they wrote songs about girls, which you know, I was trying to figure that out myself. Um, and it was just awesome. It, it was a release. It was an escape from what was going on at home. It was an escape from the uncertainty. It was an escape from, from um, trying to figure out how to be a kid and navigate the world. And that led into sort of post-hardcore and punk. This is Fugazi. Um, they're back in DC, if anybody's not familiar with them. They're one of the most influential bands you've never heard of, if you haven't heard of them. They've never charged more than five bucks for a show. They've never charged more than five dollars for an album. They've been offered millions of dollars to do tours. They refused it. They kept it pure. They kept it the thing that you thought. Because and that was a Green Day, a little humble moment. I cried when they got signed. I gotta say, when I saw them on MTV, I got really upset that I was never gonna be able to go back to that place and experience that with them again. Um, this band never did that. So the people who love this band, it's always been this. It's been this for 30 years. They broke. They don't really play now, but neither here nor there. Uh, the guy who's sort of bending over is the guy responsible for Straight Edge. If anybody's familiar with that, he's the guy who wrote a song about it when he was 17 about how he didn't want to do drugs and didn't want to be an asshole. And that became an entire movement that lasts to this day. There's a lot of assholes in that movement, by the way. <laughs> um, and this is me, trying to do that other thing. I got the same car as him. Um, so, and Anthony here, I'm gonna embarrass you for a second. Anthony is the creative director of one of my companies now, but me and Anthony did a lot of that jumping in bands and running around the country and playing music together um, for a few years. So thanks for falling into that. But, uh, spoiler alert, I'm not a famous musician. <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> and then, honestly, I'm, I feel bad that I, anybody ever heard me sing. <laughs> but what I did do is I, I started realizing that I wasn't going to be a famous musician, but I still wanted, I didn't want to leave music. I didn't want to get away from music. I wanted to be a part of music. I wanted to create. And uh, just as a byproduct of starting a band, you end up being your own designer, your own accountant, your own manager, your own everything. So that's how I kind of fell in love with design. When I was um, 19, I, I spent $500 and bought a PC from a friend of mine and then started teaching myself how to design. I taught myself how to do HTML and, and CS. Everything I've, I've learned has been self-taught. And then I started starting companies. This is that path, right? This is what, if you go to LinkedIn or something like that, this is that path that you're going to see of that story. Like, oh, I, I knew the guys at Papa Roach and they hired us to do a website. So me and my partner, who were huddled around one computer, doing work, um, ran to Fry's about a second computer, so we could, you know, now both do work. Uh, and then I started a management company, and then I worked at Buck Wild, and then, you know, it, it's like, oh, it's a perfect, you know. It ends up looking more like this. I mean, I worked at Fresh Choice, so I was trying to be a promoter, and, you know, playing a band. And I worked at Baker Square, and then, you know, I, I convinced the city of Apple to hire me to do those shows the guys in high school did because they stopped doing them. And I worked at Kinko's while I started my first agency, which was Affleck Studio here in, in Sacramento. And we actually were in the uh, Citizen Hotel, before it was the Citizen Hotel, which is like the cheapest 
uh, real estate you could get for an office. There's all lobbyists and stuff. And, and ironically, Buck Wild started as a Sun Hotel too, like a couple years later. Like we found that out later. Then I moved to Seattle and took the job at my first music industry job at uh, Tupinel Records, where I was hired as a designer. And by the end, I was doing A&R and design and video and websites and, and whatever I could get my hands on. And then the guys in Papa Roach called again and said, do you want to go on tour? And I was 24 years old, and I said, shit, yeah, I want to go on tour. That sounds awesome. Um, so I toured with those guys for a few years. And, and that's really like the power of sound. Like, I mean, that moment, like those guys, you know, growing up with them and knowing them and, and you know, the song that they wrote, they wrote, you can take one song. They wrote one song that changed their entire lives. And that one song connected people. It was about suicide. It was about, um, you know, and some people might, you know, as we get older, might think it's cheesy, but that song sold three or four million records for them. Opened up a career that they still do to this day. And they still, you go to Europe and you see them play that same song 20 something years later, people cry listening to that song. It affects people. And that song gave me probably my career, my wife, my children, the companies I've been able to start, it opened that door for me. Now they didn't do that, they opened a door and then I had to go do a bunch of shit and pick me with other people. But that's the power of music. And, and, and it's so interesting to me that you know, these guys write one song and there's children that exist and marriages that exist and humans that exist on this planet because of that opportunity that came from that. Um, so I continued on, so the, the thing here is that it's a little more chaotic. For most of my career, I've had three or four jobs. What's missing from here is the freelance work that I did the entire time. Um, it's not, you know, and there's, there's failure. This time last year, uh, this is probably news to anybody who worked with me at Q. This time last year, I thought that I might have to shut the doors on one of my companies and fire all the people on, in, on the team within a time frame of a few months. So every day I walked in the office, I had to look at my staff and be like, I better pull around out of the pack here. Um, and then, you know, out of nowhere, not out of nowhere, but a few months later, we managed to negotiate and sell the company, and now everybody you know, works at a new company, has a new opportunity, and it's amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm a little away there. So what is it about music that has like, driven me this way, and, and I think drives people this way? And to me, I think it's the authenticity. It's, it's the purest thing of any sense. When something's authentic, you feel it. Whether it's food, whether it's something you hear, whether it's something you see, if it touches your soul, it's real. And much of what we see in, in, in the world or what we you know, hear from people when they go on TV and they talk or from politicians or from whatever, it's not authentic. It's, it's crafted, it's measured, it's calculated to elicit something, to get a response from somebody. And to me, the, like music, you know when you break up, everybody here is probably going to break up song for sure. <laughs> if you don't, Taylor Swift's entire last album. <laughs> All good. Um, to me, it was authenticity. And, and so being able to know that something is real and, and that something um, that you can put something into yourself and connect with other people, whether it's the design work that I was doing, the websites, the music I was creating, or the company that I was creating. And it's been a very fortunate, it's unlocked an unbelievable amount of connections and friendships and um, just power to be able to start something from scratch and to continue to do it in a place like Sacramento, where conveniently most people leave. You know, one of the companies, Patrick Studio, we all left, we moved to Seattle. And one of those guys is now creative director of Digital Kitchen. The other two guys are in a company called Invisible Creature. They've been nominated for Grammys for album packages and we did a lot of amazing work and you're probably very familiar with some of the work that they did. But we had to leave to do that and that always bothered me that you had to leave a place like this, because it's a great place. So to be able to start four companies in Sacramento, two of them still exist. Um, yeah, they still exist. Uh, right? But you work there, it's still there? Um, that's a cool thing, you know, and I think that to, to, it was never motivated by money for me. It was never motivated by anything other than wanting to do something cool and interesting. And so, I mean, my hope today was to try and share that story. And I have no more slides. It like runs out from here, so I'm, I'm kind of winning it now. Um, to share that story and, and to share like the part that I think that always has driven me is like that, that idea of doubt, the idea of fear, the idea of like what the hell am I doing with my life or how am I going to do this or how am I going to make it out of the situation. After 25 years, I can't tell you how many times that I thought I was going to have to go get a real job. 
you know, like have to go do something I hated or have to just cash on the chips because I got kids to feed or a wife who depends on me. And then it seemed like just around the corner, something happened. You know, just saying that little extra bit of dedicated opened up that next door or that next opportunity. And it's not, you know, that's, that's one of those lofty things that people say, like, it'll work out. It doesn't just work out. It works out because you keep trying. You know, like nothing just works out. Somebody just walk in the door and say, hey, we saw your stress. We're just going to save your ass. Um, <laughs> it works because you keep staying driven. You keep staying dedicated. You keep believing in yourself. You keep knowing that today sucks. I have one day to pout about it. And then I have to get back on the horse tomorrow and keep pushing forward. And that's sort of been the continual theme of my career and picking great people to invest in and good friends to have around you. The thing that's most interesting about it is that to me, and talking about through with my wife, and some of the stuff you, 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 know, you realize when you don't, you don't feel something or something's not big to you until you um, start to say it out loud, or you talk to somebody, and you're like, oh shit, I didn't realize I felt that way. Um, when talking to my wife about this before I came down here over the last couple of nights, is I was always looking for a community, and I was always looking for some form of stability. And I found it in music, and I found it in, in um, design, and I found it in skateboarding back in the day. And I found it in business with the great friends that I found. And, and more importantly, I found that stability. I've lived in the same house for 80 years. It's amazing. Um, my children have never had to pack their boxes and go to a new place and meet new people. And I don't worry about how we're going to pay our bills and how we're going to feed them or if they're, you know, if we're going to have to run to a new place. Um, and I have a great community around me. So, uh, I'd like to open up questions. I, am I like, way early? Did I talk super fast? Or? No, I think you're good. Okay. I have questions. I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to leave it there, because I think this is the most, the most interesting part of these things, is that I don't know if somebody was participating. Mm -hmm. Well, they ended on a high note. She said not to end it when it's awkward. So is it awkward? <laughs> now it is. Or no, it's not. I don't know. OK. Yeah, um, so I questions. Now it's awkward. <laughs> okay, right back in. That's a good question. I've lost over that. Ironically, um, and how many people here own their own businesses? Cool. So, what, what, and are, how many of you are actually still active creatives in those businesses? So, if you're successful, that'll end. Um, <laughs> so, that, that's the ironic thing. All I ever wanted to do was be creative and create cool things. And then something happened along the way. Um, when I started, one of, I'm sorry, this is going to be a really long-winded answer to your question, but that's my style. So <laughs> when I started Ground Control Wonderful Union, we changed the name, I'm not going to get into that. Um, I was a creative director. So I designed a product. I designed you know, websites. So uh, I was really in it to design. As the company progressed, and we had people, you know, partners leave and things like that, I ended up really taking on a financial side of the business, which remember earlier on the GED. Um, and I ended up kind of really getting immersed in the business and the process and things like that. So then I ended up not doing a lot of design. So I've been in, in, in music and creative for 25 years, and I probably haven't been an active creative um, for the probably last five. But my spreadsheets look awesome. <laughs> like, they're centered. They're all Helvetica. They're, they're beautiful. Um, so I ended up finding myself doing a lot of music at home because of that. Like that, that desire to do things never goes away. Like the desire to create never goes away. So I ended up doing a lot of like writing songs that nobody would ever hear except for my daughters, and they're huge fans. <laughs> um, or you know, just like any little project I get, or if I can like you know do a sales deck or something for. So my current job is I run music and live events for Eventbrite North America, so Canada, the United States, which really means um, I run the business acquisition, which really means sales. Um, you just have to go down through the bullshit words and just get like, sales. And then I also lean in on product road mapping, um, what we're going to build, strategy for the music at Eventbrite. What a company like Eventbrite, who's very horizontal and does everything from events like this to large concerts and, and Tough Mudders, um, how do we take that and apply it to music specifically? How do we speak to music organizers, music fans? How do we create a product that enhances that experience and, and makes something better for those people? So, did I, did I get it? Okay. Next, anybody? Yes. What's the best song you ever heard? Uh, my daughter's first cry, actually. I heard, I remember very vividly. It was terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Can you describe a moment in your life when you made a choice that zigged instead of zagged, and like go back to that moment, you're like, wow, everything could have been different. 
but it wasn't exciting as much as Yeah, I mean, so when I worked at Tooth and Nail in Seattle, like I, I stopped playing music. Um, we, me and Anthony had been in a band together, and uh, we almost got it. We were right there, did a couple tours, and then singer quit. And so I stopped playing music, and I started to look for like, how would I, whatever. Um, and I moved to Seattle, and I got a phone call from, um, I used to get phone calls all the time about, like, hey, join our band. And I mean, I had health benefits. I was in music, and I made a steady paycheck, but I didn't have to get in a van, and I didn't have to risk my uh, singer just dropping out at the minute to go join another band. Um, so I got asked to move to Chicago to join a band, which was a cool band. Um, they didn't make it either, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, that would have been that would have been probably the more like sticking to it path. That would have been like the I'm gonna be a rock star and I'm gonna go live in Chicago and pop rock forever and freeze my ass off actually too. Maybe if, maybe if it was like Florida, I might have done it. But, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that that was sort of like a staying true. And, and another one was you know a more concrete one. So I had two companies simultaneously. So when I worked at Buff Wild, we started Ground Control. And I started the Area Foundation with Eric, who's the owner of Ace of Spades, and if you guys are familiar with him. So I had three jobs in two companies, and, and I thought one of them would be good, and they both were doing really well. And Eric had expressed, like, hey man, like this thing's getting crazy, like I need more of you. And I just sort of looked at the, the two, and I mean, he made a lot of money, so I might have made a wrong decision. Um, I looked at the two things, and that job was running around the country like fighting your ass off for 17 year old kids in bands only to get fired. You know, it's like one scenario is they're super successful and they fire you and hire a bigger time manager, or you spend five years trying to build a career and they wake up and you have nothing to show for it. And oh, by the way, if you need to like fly to Canada and convince all four of them they shouldn't punch each other and do tons of cocaine. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'm good. So I told Eric basically, you know, like, uh, I. Um, yeah, I just, I just chose to double down on, on what we were doing. It, it felt more like me, it felt more like design, it felt more like product solutions um, and creativity rather than um, being a mom to like <laughs> four teenage boys who were just <clears throat> bonkers. And you know, we managed a ton of it, and it was like that with every one of them. So I was just like, yeah, I'm good. I'm out. Um, so yeah, that was like a weird decision, to, a tough decision. What do you think Sacramento's best kept music secret is? Ooh, I think I can it. Best kept music secret. Shit. Uh, I think it's like the, the the amount of bands that have come from here, you know, and the amount of creativity that happens here. I think that people are usually not aware of like how much music has been created here and how many great talented musicians there are here. Um, that's a really terrible answer, but I don't really know. Like, I, I, to me, that always blows my mind. Like, Chelsea Wolf is from here. Um, the Death Grips guys are from here. Cake is from here. Like, when, whenever you find out that people grew up here and they had to leave, for one end, it's like, that's great, you came from here. I think that um, some of the Odd Future guys are from here. Uh, the part that always pisses me off is they left, right? Because you don't end up getting like something like Austin or, but those things kind of don't really, with the globalization of streaming and music, like, you don't really get as many local scenes as you used to. Like, it doesn't bubble somewhere before everybody else finds out about it. So like Seattle would never happen again because the minute they start a band, they're on Spotify, and they're on the internet, and everybody knows about them, but they don't sort of just bubble in the market. But um, yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the general community's attitude towards design in Sacramento as opposed to like that? It's an age-old question. Um, oh, that's a, that's a good one. Man, you guys are really good questions. <laughs> so I, I would say this. I would say that the, sac the design community in Sacramento, what it is today versus what it was, say, 10 years ago, like this is this would never happen 10 years ago. This is like hugely inspirational that, to have this many people gather in a room who want to talk about creativity. And I'm, I know that I probably didn't talk much about creativity, but whatever, it's my own or whatever it is. Um, the value of design, like, that's a tricky one, right? Because when you have the, the complete democratization of design, just like with music, like, I can literally open up my laptop in my car and record a song. And the same thing goes for design, you know, where 
somebody can download Photoshop and start teaching this. I did, right? I, I, I would have never gotten into design 25 years ago because you had to learn, you know, about trapping and offsets, you know, printing styles and papers and all this crazy shit that was technical. It was much more of a craft back then. And so it kept people out. The barrier of entry was that. But when you bring up barrier of entry, two things happen. One thing, anybody can do it. Anybody can get a computer and start designing. And two, anybody can do it so the work starts to look like shit. So, and then it starts to get devalued because my cousin or my grandson does design, why should I pay you? You know? Um, and then it affects taste. So then it, it's, there's no real way to do that. It's really just trying to identify and hold yourself more accountable to the kind of work you want to do and how you want to value yourself, which is tough, right? You know, those are tough decisions. Like you might have to forego something because it's not the kind of work you want to do or you don't feel like you're being valued. But on the flip side, I've done work, I've done album packages for $25,000 and then a week later did an album package for $500. Just because, you know, at the time I wasn't in a place where I could say no to work. And you gotta keep the, you know, gotta keep the Indian grease. You gotta, you gotta, daddy's gotta eat. So, um, obviously. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, I think it's hard. It's hard to get an entire community to, to value design higher. But I think what you, when you see, you know, restaurants like, say, Lowbrow or Temple, or when their design aesthetic steps up a little bit, then the entire aesthetic starts to step up a little bit. And people start to value and they want to emulate what they see. So then they have to hire people who have the ability to emulate what they see. I, I have something to add to that too. Yeah. Um, and I also, I'm going to kind of segue into the wrap up, but I also think it's valuing each other. Like, I think there's been a history of creatives not valuing each other and supporting each other and being more competitive yeah. and collaborative. I think that's shifting. I think this is really showing it. And I think there's more and more opportunity to do that here. And I think you guys should know there's room for us all, there's clients for us all, and we can just help raise each other. And that's, and that's life and business in general. You never know. I never know if one of the employees I hired for an hourly position 10 years ago is a guy I want to hire me 10 years from now. And you never know the people in the community, like you're only as strong as the community and you need each other to prop each other up and you're going to move from agency to agency or, or position to position and you need those people. So treat each other kindly, support each other and it'll actually pay off in the long run. I think that's it, you All right. it. Yay.